the first one we are, we, are, we are going to look at is the church as the hierarchical society. The church is hierarchically structured, okay? The hierarchical nature of the church helps the church to be effective in her mission here on earth. The church being hierarchical also means that the church is supposed to have rules and regulations that should help to govern the church, that should help to organize the church here on earth. So the church has rules and regulations and all her children have to know these rules and they have to abide by them. Now, when you talk about uh, the hierarchy of the church, you are talking of God as the beginning point, okay? God is the beginning point. Then from God, we come to Jesus as his son whom we sent here on earth to found the same church. Okay, so God, Jesus. Now Jesus, when he founded the church, he shared this noble responsibility with the disciples who later became elders of different churches after he had gone. So Jesus, the apostles whom today we can refer to as the bishops, but these bishops are headed by the Pope and the bishops are around him. So the bishops as the close collaborators of the Pope, from there you are talking of now the priests and the deacons, okay, who are also close collaborators of the bishops. From the priests and the deacons, you come down now to the laity, the, the lay people. So this is basically the hierarchy of the church. Even though we have all these structures in the church, there's still unity because these do not exist one independent of the other. They are interconnected such that there is a continued unity being observed in their operations. We come to the second point. The church as a mystery. Now, when you hear the word mystery, immediately what comes to your mind is something that cannot be comprehended. But this is not understood in that manner. The church as a mystery simply means that the church is connected to the transcendental reality. Now, the transcendental reality is the world beyond this world that we're able to perceive with our senses. When we talk of the transcendence, the transcendental reality, we are talking of the dwelling of God. So the church exists here on earth, but it is derived from the transcendental reality. So the connection between the, the earthly church and the heavenly church, that connection is what creates the mystery. Then the second point on this one is that um, since the church is derived from that transcendental reality, the effects that this church has here on earth are also coming from there. So when the church is blessing, the blessing is not coming from the church itself. It is coming from that, that reality, that divine reality, because the church is constantly connected to that transcendental reality. In a nutshell, when we say the church is a mystery, we are saying that the church is both divine and human. Now, the connection between the, divine, the human church and the divine church, that connection, that link, is what creates the mystery. The third point is kind of connected to what we are, we are just from talking about. The church is a sacrament. The church is understood as a sacrament. The church is the visible reality of the invisible world, of the invisible divine reality. So when the church is conferring sacraments here on earth, the church is representing what we are not able to see, which is the reality of God. So the church being a sacrament, Jesus uses her as a tool to sanctify our world, okay? So the sacramental nature of the church is connected to what we are not able to see, or what we are not able to perceive with our senses which is the world beyond this world. The fourth point is that the church is the work of the Trinity. What this means is that the church comes from God, founded by Jesus here on earth, and our work is visible through the power of, um, uh, of the Holy Spirit. The other point to highlight on this one is that um, the church is united. In other words, 
the same unity that we perceive in the Trinity is, is seen also in the church. Like we say, the, the church is hierarchically structured. Now, these structures do not exist in one independent of the other. They are all united because this unity that we see in the church is driving from the unity that we see in the Trinity. So, to be in communion, to be in communion with the Trinity, you need to be in communion with the church as well. The fifth point and the last one is that the church is a family of God. This theme came out very strongly during the African Synod in 1994. The year after, in 1995, the then Pope, John Paul II, produced a document called Ecclesia in Africa. This was uh, an exhortation. It was a reflection of what, what was discussed earlier at the Synod, at the African Synod. For the typical African family, the family is not just the nuclear society, it is also the extended society. St. John Paul II emphasizes that when you say the church is the family of God, we are not just talking about the people that are baptized in the church. We are talking about the extended family members as well, meaning those that are outside the church. In other words, the church is open to people that are not yet baptized as Catholics. The doors are still open to them. So this theme is very important and it is still very strong, especially in the African church, because our way of being family is not just nuclear, but also extended. And this aspect becomes very important for the church as well. Now, members of the family have a father or at least there is a father figure in that in that family. Equally, when we look at the church, we are looking at God as our, our father, and all of us, the rest of us, as brothers and sisters in Christ, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. When we gather at Mass to pray, we gather there not as strangers anymore, but as members who belong to the same family, which we call the family of God. Okay, so that said, I think we have um, we are done with uh, with definitions of of who we are as the church. We started with the biblical images, and today we looked at the traditional images.